Welcome to Cookbook. I'm Darren Demery, and today we have poet Paige Lewis coming to pay us a visit. We are going to make a special dessert with plums and vanilla ice cream. I'm really excited to see how it comes together. Uh, and then we'll get a chance to sit down with her and talk about her chapbook, uh, Reasons to Wake You. It's coming out next year on Tupelo Press. Uh, and get to talk about poetry and a bunch of other things. So, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Cookbook. Paige Lewis, and she is here to teach us how to make her wonderful plums dessert. So what is this actually called? Oh, I don't even have a name for it. It's just Should roasted it? plums with <laughs> vanilla ice cream. <laughs> We're going to go with it. So we've got the oven preheating to 400 degrees, so that's what you need to turn up to. What do I do next? Um, so we're going to slice the plums. Okay. We're just going to have them. Um, make sure to take the pit out of really? the plums. <laughs> That had to be fairly new at that point. That was a treat. Yeah. All right. right now, the plums seem pretty cold, so it works for right now. <laughs> sure, so they just go face up? Mm -hmm. Face up. Okay. Um, and then um, once those are all halved, we're going to drizzle some honey and some melted butter on them. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. how did you come across this? Um, a friend Ooh. from a few years ago wanted to make something that seemed healthy but wasn't. Excellent. So <laughs> we're like, well, plums are good. Why don't we ruin and their like health by by you didn't making have any them frosting to dip apples in or anything like that? No, no, no. All right. Yeah, it's hard to keep frosting in my house for very long because I'll just eat it. Just um, that can? Yeah, it's there gross. <laughs> uh, for us in this house, it's syrup. All the, all the kids syrup, want really? is things that they can put syrup on. Really? So we have pancakes, we have waffles, we have French toast sticks. That's, uh, so it's become it's become an issue. Yeah, well, Cobb is a big fan of waffles. I've had to like buy multiple waffle makers until we found the perfect How one. many waffle makers have you bought? We, we, I think three, honestly, because the first one didn't actually turn, and I didn't realize that, and so they were, they were like subpar, and I didn't yeah. want to... So that like waffles. the waffle makers at like a Motel Six or like the like the one yeah, like, the, like professional... the, the professional it has wow. to be like or else like I'm just gonna go to a place that actually can make good waffles. Is there like a good brunch place? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but do you, is there anything weird that you put syrup on that they love? They at my daughter's school they do chicken and waffle sticks. Ah. And so I think she's finally gotten the idea about chicken and waffles. So oh, I'm excited cool. about that. Yeah. There's some places uh, here in Columbus and in Cleveland that do these incredible brunches that have mm -hmm. chicken and waffles, and so i got to get her to one of those places. Yeah. Well, so if they're will. not in sticks, though, she might not be into it. The sticks part, we can cut them. <laughs> we'll be fine. All right, so we've got all of these in our container face up. So we got to heat some of that butter up, okay. two tablespoons of that, and you can just melt it all in the microwave. Sure. Um, doesn't have to be fancy. Even when I have to like make cookies and it's like soften the butter, like leave it out of like the very, no, nope, a I'm very vague patient. language. Yeah, of, I'm sure. so with that, so I'm glad that this just calls for melted butter. Alright. Because I never remember to take the butter out of the No, no. Planning your cookies. No. Alright. Thank you. Alright. Barley and Mia have joined us. <laughs> I know you like the plums. Wait, would they? I don't know. I had a cat that liked corn and watermelon, so sometimes animals like Like little kernels? Yeah, like, yeah. Like little, okay. little, um, I don't remember them ever trying to like eat a whole ear of corn. Sure. Either. I took care of a, a baby for a year, and her favorite thing to eat was corn on the cob. You could give her like 45 minutes and put <laughs> like a little corn, and she would just ha. It was fantastic. And so you're just gonna drizzle it on everything. Drizzle, yeah, drizzle it all over those bad boys. And then you can drizzle the honey, and it'll get a little messy because you want to make sure it's kind of coating all over the top of it. Okay. Yeah, this I'm about to do one. Nice. It's always exciting when you have something you can pull yeah. that it's hot off of. Now I've got butter in my hands. Though. Oh, I can do it. You want me to try it? <laughs> I don't want you to have a knife in there while you're already like have slippery hands. You guys remember that episode of Cookbook where Darren cut himself? Oh my god. Oh man. 
No, not it, again. Again, I'm still embarrassed by the time I just spilled sugar everywhere. So it's, <laughs> it's been bloodless so far. Well, and when you spill something, like that, it's hard to actually find all of the like greens. Like oh, yeah. you're gonna have that on months. your feet all the time. Okay. Okay. So that looks great. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've got the plums half and face up. We've got the butter on it, we've got the honey on it, and now we just need to put it in the oven? Yep. Okay. So when this gets to 400, we're going to put it in the oven, and then we've got our vanilla ice cream. Now when we put the vanilla, does the vanilla go on top or does it go on the bottom? So it's up yeah. to you. Uh, it's kind of fun to put it on top because then it kind of seeps into the... I like that this, the this is our have no rules. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's all, it's all going to taste the same no matter how you put it together, which mm -hmm. is great. Like you can't really mess it up. This is true. Yeah. All right, so when this gets to 400 degrees, we're going to put this in the oven and then we'll serve it up with uh, some of this vanilla ice cream. Uh, until then, Paige and I are going to sit down and get to talk a little bit about poetry. Uh, we've got a reading tonight, so yeah. it'll be good to get in the zone before we do that. We'll be right back. Oven, so we will get to have some of that deliciousness soon. So while they're cooking, I wanted to get a chance to talk to Paige about poetry. So I got to read the chapbook that's coming out next year, mm -hmm. Reasons to Wait. It's incredible. Thank you. It's okay. very good. I'm glad that you liked it. It's got this ornery bit to it that um, there's a lot of elegant images and phrases, but it's like, this, this is what came up when I read it again today, is that it moves in a way that's a very well put together dancer that at a certain point you catch them smile. You don't, a dancer who's doing their thing and really putting on a show and has the energy going, you sort of fall into their movement and what they're doing and occasionally they'll slow down so you can see it's a person. Mm. You know what I mean? I and when there are certain ballets and certain modern dance pieces where the movement becomes the person and the person sort of get, gets erased. And that happens sometimes in poetry where there's someone who's putting together a really elegant poem about something profound and sort of the voice disappears in it. And you're able to do some of that same work, but at a certain point in almost all those poems, we catch a bit of your face. We see some of your voice that's, that's more unique um, and is sometimes funny and is sometimes there's a little edge to it. Um, but it's, it's poetry that has something unexpected because you give us an, an entryway to it that is sometimes graceful and then we get caught off guard by the energy and the music and what happens ultimately in it. So that's what I kept thinking about when I was thinking about, well, how, how can I fit this? Because I really like that little bit of it, of this sort of mad dancer going and going and in the middle of the twirls, we catch like the full face of what's going on. How's your right? How does your how do you do that? Um, I, I, I really appreciate that. That's really sweet of you to say um, mm -hmm. And especially because I've never been good at dancing at all And so I'm just like, oh, okay, so I can at least do it through poetry. Peaked in middle school dance with the, with the silk shirts on. That was me. Yeah, um, um, but um, I would say that I sometimes actually get nervous about not being in the poems at all and so mm -hmm. it's good to hear that you can actually see sure. like my voice um mainly because i've always been drawn really to persona poems mm -hmm. and so that is part of like putting on a mask and, and being someone else for a little while without with still having some of you in there mm -hmm. to like make it a real and how much that was poem. was driven by this project and this title reasons to wake you is a very specific title mm -hmm. um and we we get in that in that book, who the you is, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, did that in this project ground you more? Because I've read your other poems in other places, mm -hmm. and you can tell that this this chapbook fits together really well. Um, is having that specificity of that you in the book sort of help keep you where you want to be? Yeah, I think so. And and being able to balance how much of it is about the you in the in the chat book and how much of it is about the eye of the speaker, sure. right? And, and and that's kind of part of the the struggle throughout the chat book, at least I think, is to, um, is it the speaker still being themselves while kind of losing themselves in love? Like, well, and like, it's, it's a thought process. The fact that it's reasons to wake you, the voice, the eye is coming up and generating and sometimes saying no and sometimes saying yes right. to what, it, what, what is it worth? 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 I think that um, at least as a human in this world, right, mm -hmm. um, it is hard to sometimes um, still feel like an individual when you sure. are um, part of a couple, and and trying to navigate that, and mm -hmm. sometimes you feel um, either resentment or you feel uh, sure. a little bit of like you feel erased. Mm -hmm. um, for like no one's fault, but just like losing yourself in like love and, and sure. being like wait, but also I want this last piece of cake and I also want. To. Well, go go back to like the the really sort of arch the you know you complete me that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, no motherfucker, I'm complete. Right. And right. I love right. you and right. you love me. Exactly. And not not sort of being willing to give up okay. that part of yourself in the process. Yeah. But that that doesn't make it a, like you don't need to be completed by someone to make the love not profound. Exactly, right. um, and I think that sometimes in the in the chapbook and sometimes in the poems, the the speaker is battling against the you in that way. I mean, like, okay. no, I am I am myself, sure. and I can do things for myself. And, right. and um, but also, I think it's more the speaker battling themselves mm -hmm. and trying to be like remember that this is you. Like, right. remember who you are before. You well, the I and the you separates everything from the we. You know what yes. I mean? Sometimes I'm going to want you at arm's length, sometimes mm -hmm. I'm going to need you out of the room, sometimes I want you next to me, yeah, yeah. and sort of how that process finds itself as what felt like two people finding what the right distance from poem to poem needs to be, mm -hmm. right? When we talk about um, love in that way and that sort of, those sort of promises, it can get convoluted pretty quickly and identities get mangled and sometimes lost. And sometimes it's nice to be lost. Sometimes yeah. it's sometimes it's very necessary to be mm -hmm. you and be found completely outside of someone else. Yeah. And that's one of the things I got I got from the book. Well good. <laughs> right. Right. I'm glad that they came across. So when when did you put these poems together? Um uh, well I started writing them um, probably about a year or two. Maybe two years ago, okay. uh, I started writing Reasons to Wake You was probably the first poem out of all of these poems. Okay. Um, and uh, Workshopping so, it at school or just sort of... Workshopping sure. it at school, but it started actually as a project um, with Kave, like mm -hmm. Kave Akbar. His, uh, we had just recently met and we wanted to impress each other by doing a 30 poem a day thing. Sure. And only sending them to each other. Like, so we started, but we wanted to impress each other so much that we were only spending our days writing these poems. There you go. And so they turned out like way better than poems that I'd written before them. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those poems was Reasons to Wake You. Sure. And kind of a love poem for Kave. Right. And, um, it actually had started out um, with a, like a previous partner had been like, don't wake me up to tell me things. And I was like, I bet, I bet Kyle would like it if I did yeah. these, these things. And so it was kind of like a love, a love sure. poem based off of like a weird slight that I had had before. Um, right. And so it started with that mm -hmm. and then uh, it's been kind of just navigating all of these different uh, feelings about huh. love, but um, they all kind of, came together because they were kind of all love songs. Really. Sure. Uh, I mean, some of them are a little bit near. Well, yeah, and the, the edge and the questions and things like that. I got obsessed and up upset. Um, I'd been, because um, I had, I had a, a, a professor in grad school who was like, Darren, every poem you write is a love poem. Don't, don't mess around. It's this who you are, no matter what it is. And so I was really sort of studying and I had one teacher give me Catullus, and I had one teacher give me, I would always loved Robert Creeley. Mm -hmm. um, and I got really sort of obsessed with the Robert Creeley poem, The Whip. Um, the, whole, the whole idea of love making someone say, ugh, mm -hmm. right? The, I think to say this wrongly. Um, and so I actually taught a workshop at Sundress once about how to, how to write a love poem that doesn't suck. Oh, all great. around using the word ugh and things like that. Oh, I love that. So, when I started writing those Emily As poems, one of the things was I found a good a, a part of my voice that I liked that was a little bit more um, mean or sexy or, or um, something exploring more. And I got good at writing those poems. And then I started to fuck with it. <laughs> because I think as soon as you find that tether that you can mess with and invert, mm -hmm. and at a certain point, like I know what I'm reading tonight. 
And I know some of the, a couple of the Emily As poems are complete fiction. They're not, they're right, not based right, in anything. Right. At this point, um, it's getting to take the accepted voice and what people like and mess with it and invert it and yeah. change the expectations. And that, to me, is what's interesting about love poems. Like, um, I, uh, when I went to Maggie at Maggie Smith's book launch last mm -hmm. week, and all the all the excitement with Good Bones, it was it was a great read. Um, that works because of the onus she puts on shithole, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's a love yeah. poem for her kids, right? And it's successful because it's able to flip things and get more out of the action of the flip. You can't just rely on the music and energy of poetry. Right. You've got to do something with it. And she does that so elegantly that it feels loving. The word yeah. shithole feels loving. Right, in that instance, um, yes. <laughs> And so it, getting to mess with that and, and finding different ways is something that you, you did in the chapbook, which is one of the more impressive things that you can do with love poems is not just this, this is a sincere feeling, right. but this is something that's explored and you know what? There is attention to exploring love as opposed mm -hmm. to just taking and giving love, right. which is where all the good poetry comes from. Yeah, yeah, and that's that was a. I, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's like when you if um, when you get good at something, mm -hmm. uh, it, it can get boring. Or you can feel like am I just sure. doing the same thing over and over? And I never want to be doing the same thing over. And so. I feel like no matter what, every poem I write is going to be a love poem, even sure. it's like about the weirdest things. Um, and and that so... David Schloss was right. <laughs> All right, fair and enough. I was like, I'm fine with that, though. Yeah. I, love, I love it. And sure. I love love poems. And um, But it is about finding like the turn, right? Mm -hmm. Like how, how can you flip this so it's it's different or it's exploring sure. other things besides love. Love can just mm -hmm. be in the background for certain poems. Mm -hmm. or, um, maybe no one will see love in one poem that I see a lot of love in, right? Right. And, and so sometimes it means... Sometimes love is just surviving the poem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. Look, this all happened and we made it out. Yeah, it's and, so, good. and there's like a, I've got like a poem about trying to like stop someone from robbing a museum, right? Sure. And so it's it's like a, a love poem in that two people are trying to do this together, but it's more just about like, hey, right. we're gonna... We gotta make sure no one's taking these diamonds, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and so it's fun to make these these things up, but and I hope that sometimes when it like swerves into that kind of fiction, like it's mm -hmm. obvious that a lot of the moments in here are also fiction, and sure. that like no one should be reading them as like like oh okay this is exactly what's happening. Well, they can they can take it however they want. Right, right, but and I, I just like. It's fun to just be like, okay, these are love poems, but they're not about this person. Sure. Like, I, they're just like, and like Emily, right? Yeah. The name Emily sure. is going to make people, okay, what's, this is obviously about your wife. And, sure. and you're going to make stuff up. That's what poems are <laughs> about. You can have right. a lot of fun with that. And then it gets, it's gotten, it's gone to like, several levels of meta where I got a poem about Emily at one of the readings and getting excited oh about gosh. the poems oh, and sort of cool. like lying about the poems, sort of being like, yeah, that's, that, 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 that's, <laughs> that's true. Oh, that's and that, that whole poem is about me getting away with it because I had sincere questions about whether or not it was okay to take a real woman and use her in that fashion because it's using mm -hmm. to a certain extent and whether or not that was okay and I went through this whole dialogue with some some friends of mine about am I doing the like is this abuse almost sort of thing right like am I using her the wrong way in this way and they ultimately said no this is not you're not abusive you're never mean you're never any of these things you're just taking what is a traditional love trope mm -hmm. sort of a one love sort of thing and you're right. playing around with it right and there's so, this like um I mean, if you think of someone like Marianne Moore sure. writing poetry about animals and mm -hmm. trying, like, there's, um, I've read uh, essays, and I'm going to forget who wrote them because I'm bad at names, about Marianne Moore's um, treatment of animals, right? Mm -hmm. Even just describing them, that objectifies them, and that is like a violence against the animal, right? And so right. there's like, it's really hard to navigate that when you're trying to basically put someone on the page that is, and you're sure. not that person, right? You're always going to be... I think, I think if you can accept the idea as a poet that at the end of the poem, you're not getting out clean no matter what. Right, right. It's fine, <laughs> right? I've written this poem, I've turned all of these things into something that I put my name on. Yeah, I'm culpable. In one way or the other, mm -hmm. I don't know how much guilt is assigned to that, but right. you're responsible anyway. Right, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and so that's been something interesting to navigate, especially when writing like persona poems. Like there's sure. one poem about um, 
the woman who was actually like struck by a meteorite in my, in right. my book. And, uh, the only one who ever officially died by a... Well, not even died. She survived. She's she, the only... Per she's the first known survivor and the only like. known... Like, there's to be struck by a meteorite. Right. And yeah. so, so uh, it was fun to read about her, but mm -hmm. it was like, it's like, how do I put her in a poem without just it? Like, right. how do I give her a voice? Well, every time I've done like a big research project, like I've done books that were about like things I had to go research. Like mm -hmm. the, I did a book called Temporary Champions about this title fight from 1980. Um, and I did a book uh, about Sam Cooke. And every time I've started to research things, the entire project flips on my head. Mm -hmm. Like I started out writing a book of poetry about uh, obsessing about Sam Cooke and how he's the best. Because Bring It On Home To Me is the best live song of all time and I stand by it. And then it became this whole exploration of how he treated women. Right, like right. he had like a price. If you, Sam Cooke got you pregnant, he gave you 10 grand and moved on. And so it became sort of about hero worship and what happens when our heroes are terrible. And, right. and so, what that does to the, yeah. the hero himself, right? Sure. Because that's going to change. And then, the so there's like a poem in there about how, what we talk about when men talk about Sam Cooke and sort of all our involvement in hero oh, worship and things like that. But every time you go into like a research thing, it always ends up flipping a little bit on you know, how your expectation. Yeah, but I love I love researching that. Like that's so much fun. And like I, I sometimes spend the whole writing day that I have like just reading stuff. Sure. And and um, my favorite things are like really old books that you might find at like thrift stores mm -hmm. that are about like the wonders of the world or questions that children have about everything. So like what is thunder kind of. Kind of Someone funny. gave me a copy of Masters and Johnson's sex book from the 70s what? when I was in grad school. <laughs> she was like, I was trying to, I took a fiction workshop for fun. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to write a short story about a sex toy shop closing called The Last Days of the Love Factory. So this person, <laughs> who I didn't know very well, gave me this book. And it was, was fantastic. Nice yeah. It's like 300 pages of like cutting edge in the 70s sex technology. Oh, wow, that's neat. Should have read it more. I should have paid it more attention. I mean, do you still have it? I think I. It's actually in the back of the car. We're taking it to half price. Nice. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I'll, you go, could have I'll it. go pick it Would up. Would you like it? <laughs> no, I'm gonna get it from the place. <laughs> yeah. I'll wait till you drop it off. That's fine. Um, but no, and I love that because yeah. um, you're going to find images there that you've seen before because yeah. like who's reading these like old sure. thrift store books right mm -hmm. and so i'll find things that are wrong sometimes too because it'll be from like the 20s and like will man ever reach the moon and <laughs> like, probably not we probably will right. never and we'll so, be on mars by then what right, are you talking about right and so yeah. and and like they'll just like it'll be weird objective things uh, sure. or subjective things where where someone will be like well okay so uh, saturn is actually the most beautiful planet and it's like but you can't just say that to kids how how like well, who are you to say that Saturn is the most beautiful planet, right? And right. so it's just fun to find all of that and, sure. and and kind of work with that for new poems or as inspiration yeah. inspiration for new poems and like or um, I don't know if you go on Reddit ever. Not it's very kind not. of a frightening place to be. Yes, but that's what I, I, that's what I, I, I stay away from everything except for this one specific subreddit okay. that's called Today I Learned. Oh, and cool. it's just people posting all the facts that they're like learning every sure. day, right? And so like Isn't this really interesting weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there'll be really weird facts and that's probably where I learned about the meteorite, like sure. hitting um, this woman. And and uh, so I, as, as long as I stay away from all the other subreddits, I, I can enjoy that one. But sure. it's just like, I just love learning all these weird things yeah. about the world. And, and It's the fact that someone gave us Encyclopedia Britannica when we were 10 and just sort right. of never let go. Right, exactly. <laughs> and it's just amazing. And sometimes yeah. I don't get anything out of it, but the joy. Like, and all sure. I care about is really the joy. And sometimes it finds its way into poems. So right. I love that. So research is just great. Yeah. Um, so what's this, this book's coming out in 2018. Mm -hmm. What are you working on now? Um, right now, I... Um, I'm working school on a, and such. And, yeah, yeah, so well, I'm working through school and, right. uh, and in my second year of a PhD, so I'm almost mm -hmm. finished with all my coursework, and awesome. that's kind of stressful because I'm taking like an old English class and it's terrifying Jesus. because I don't know what I'm ever going to use it for. Again, sure. But like it's a lot of work uh, right. and, and just kind of navigating teaching and, and all of that and um, and writing, like trying to write as much as I can. Sure. Um, and so I'm like working on a full length right now. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and and that's been a lot of fun, and I'm still mm -hmm. kind of tweaking it, but sure. but I'm excited about it. So. What's sort of the fun part before you start to show it to everyone? And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that <laughs> is the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> and then comes the battle. The sort of. showing. <laughs> yes. 
Um, all right, so Reasons to Wake You is going to come out Tupelo 2018. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any poems coming out soon? Any magazines you're excited about? Or? Um, I've got some poems coming out in a few days at Waxwing, and I'm excited Excellent. about that. I love Waxwing. Yes. So they're one of my favorites. And then uh, my absolute favorite journal, oh. Black Warrior Review. Sure. Uh, love it so much. Got a bunch of friends down in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, oh, Fantastic. oh they're so wonderful. There. All you and everyone. Sammy. Yeah. Um, but so they. Uh, they're publishing a poem mm -hmm. in their next issue. So That's excited. awesome. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Hey, Julius, we are going to pull out the dessert here and get to have a little bit before we go to the reading. So thank you for coming. Thank you.